How do, Eric? Good morning, Alan. What do you want? Um, it's about employment. Um, I, w I went for a job recently at a local uh, bus company, and uh, they said to me, come down for a, what they call an assessment drive. And uh, I failed the assessment drive because uh, they said to me, first of all, have you ever drove anything this big before? I said, no. I with nerves and the bus being as big as it was, I failed on, you know, just doing my little technical things. But, I mean, the assessment drive, surely, after that, you would go on a, a training course to be cut, to get a PSV licence. So I don't see why, after the assessment course, they say, well, sorry, you know, you're not suitable. Well, the simple answer is that they think, rightly or wrongly, that they can tell whether a person has an aptitude for driving that size of vehicle. Yeah, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm getting at, though, Alan, is, you know, at the, at the, the time you drive the thing, you've never been in anything that big before. Don't mind. The size of it, it's a bit... It feels a bit strange. It'd be well, so big. let me tell you, I underwent such an assessment drive, and I was not daunted by the size of the vehicle, along with many other people. If you are daunted by the size of the vehicle, they will suggest that you are not really the right aptitude. Yeah, but I mean, we, we drove around for half an hour, you know, from the mm -hmm. garage around the town. No problem, straight back to the garage again. And I thought, great. And then he said, sorry. You know, you you failed. Well, that that does happen. You know, but uh, what I was thinking was, I mean, after the, after the assessment test, they don't put you straight on the road. They must give you a thorough training period beforehand, and then put you through a test for a period. Well, I, I don't know whether they do or do not give you a thorough well, training they, period. They must put they give, you, give you some training after you know after the assessment test. I got my PSV license. I went to a company. I'd already, to be honest, driven large vehicles before, but they weren't to know that. And I went to a company in Warrington called Shadwell's Coach Tours and asked them if I could be a driver. Yeah. And they said, we'll take you out in a coach. So I went out in a coach and that was that. And I just drove the coach around for half an hour and he said, yeah, all right, we'll put you on our list, get yourself a driving test and we'll put you through the test. And I wrote off and when the test arrived, I took it that day. I just went out in their coach with a guy from Shadwell's and I drove the coach round on test in Warrington and I passed my PSV. And that was that, that was it. Since then I've held a PSV. I got no lessons in the middle. When I went to work for the Ribble, which is when I used the PSV properly, I'd, used, I'd been a coach driver before then, yeah. but I went as a, on a part-time basis, but I then went to the Ribble in Ormskirk as it was and they let me drive a single decker around and they said well alright you can drive it that'll do for us you've got the license fine and then they just put me through the double decker PSV because there used to be single deck and double deck so yeah. I then had to take a double decker test but I didn't get any lessons for that either because obviously I could already drive a large vehicle yeah. so no I don't think you do have to have a massive training course some people will benefit from it but there are people who those with experience can tell do not have the aptitude for driving that kind of vehicle. Otherwise, there would be no point having the assessment drive, would there? Well, you see, I've been driving for many years cars and vans, well, but never anything... Never don't mean a thing. You, according to that company, and it may well not follow that all companies feel the same, but on the day, you did not display the aptitude that they sought. So you don't get the job. Well, it's not so bad, because I've got a second chance for them to come back again and try again, so... <laughs> Well, so go back, back and try again. But it, you know. Okay, I okay. wish you luck when you try again. I'll do Ethel. Hello, Alan. Yes. Can I just ask you a bit of advice? You can ask. Um, if a school teacher was having an affair with uh, one of the parents and somebody at the school found out, could he be dismissed? With one of the parents? Yeah. I wouldn't have thought so. I think it would be reprehensible for them to dismiss them for having an affair with a parent. Um, the parent also works at the same school. When you say works at the same school, they are colleagues? Yeah. Well, what do you mean they're a parent? They're either a well, colleague or a parent? Well, yes, yeah, she is a parent. Their children go to the school. Ah, right. So, what does that matter? Two teachers in the... St are they in the same staff room? I don't know. But two teachers are having an affair with one another. What difference does that make? Um, one's married. Well, we, we can all talk about people who have affairs when they're married, and we can say whether it's right, whether it's wrong, whether it matters, whether it doesn't, mm. but it's got damn all to do with the job. So he couldn't get the sack for it? Well, then. I don't know that he couldn't, but certainly he damn well ought not to. No. What matters is, can he teach? Yeah. Is his lifestyle 
affecting his work or his ability to teach. That's all. No, it's just that there's rumours, you say. That well, there are rumours about everybody. The world is full of them. And anyone that mouths a rumour is a disgusting beast, as far as I'm concerned. And I'm one of those people that starts rumours. Right. <laughs> oh, that'd be great fun. <laughs> OK. But, I mean, I'm sorry. What a person does in their own time is their business. Yeah. Occasionally it matters. Obviously, if, if a teacher turns out to be a rapist, mm. then he's not going to make a great teacher. Well, in fact, he might, but we're not going to want him as a teacher. Yeah. But if he merely decides that he likes the ladies and goes out and, you know, has a bit of a, what some would describe as a good time, mm. what the hell, that's his business. Okay. All right, love. All right, thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye-bye. Hello, David. Um, hello, Alan. I think that um, communism is theoretically a good idea. I think it could work in Britain. How could it work in Britain? Well, I think it'd be better than um, the present capitalism that we have. David, here. you said you think it could work in Britain. I don't want a comparative value. I want you to tell me how it would work in Britain. Well, if the Communist Party got into power. I thought you said communism. Yeah, well, the Communist Party, the same thing. No, it isn't, actually. The Communist Party doesn't market communism, but Marxism. Well, OK, Marxism, then. Well, you think Marxism would work in Britain? Yeah. How? Well, it would um, mean that everyone would be equal. I no, think it's a good idea. No, it wouldn't. The Marxism that is being run by the Communist Party of the USSR isn't everybody equal? Well, that's because it went corrupt with uh, Stalin. And oh, so what you're saying is we would actually not have communism, but not have Marxism but communism. So it wouldn't be the Communist Party at all. It would in fact be a totally new concept where there was only one party state, where the state owned everything, and we would trade with the world anyway. Yeah. And you think that'd work? Yeah, I think so. Who would do the deciding? Um, the party. Collectively. Collectively? Yeah. What do you mean by collectively? Well, they didn't vote for any decisions. Every decision would go to a vote? Yeah. We'd need a lot of paper. We'd run out of trees within a year. Um, we would run out of trees within a year. We have to delegate authority to somebody. No, I don't think that's really sensible. Well, so if we decide we're going to, let's say, put a penny on the price of butter, because remember, it's all owned by the government, we have a referendum. No, I mean... So who would decide? You have a Supreme Party. Supreme? Yeah. I thought you said we were all equal. Yeah, we are. You can't be equally supreme. One is supreme, one is not supreme. Supreme means better than another. Well, I'm not talking actually about politics here, but... You are talking about politics. You actually mentioned a political party. How can you not be talking about politics when you mention a political party? Yeah, well, I'm talking about the actual people in the country. Well, I'm sorry, David, if you're saying that if we were all equal and happy to be so, communism would work, I would say, yes, that is so. But we are not all equal, and we would not be happy to be so, even if it was attempted to convince us that we were all equal. I, for one, have no desire to be your equal. I prefer being better than you. Good night. You have been besicked. Steaks, chicken, fish, salads, pizzas, pasta, sandwiches, whatever you fancy for lunch or dinner, call into the Coach House Diner in Lytham. Five different eating areas and two exciting bars. Plenty of room for everyone. The Coach House Diner, opposite the green on Henry Street, Lytham. The Coach House Diner, this is it! Looking for a great day out? Bring the kids to Morecambe Leisure Park and laze away the day and watch the youngsters splash out in the fantastic outdoor heated pool. It's even got a wave machine. Morecambe Leisure Park. It's fantastic and costs from only £1.50 for a full day out. Phone Morecambe 424444 now for details. Here's an exciting competition run in association with high-tech replacement windows of Blackburn for all you girls who will be getting married after the 12th of September. How would you like to be Red Rose's Bride of the Year? 
To enter, all you need to do is write us a letter enclosing a recent photograph. Tell us about yourself, how you spend your time, how you met your fiancé, and any other points of interest. We'll select the finalists for our competition from the best letters we receive. The final will be at this year's wedding fair on the 13th of September at the Duncan Halch Hotel near Accrington. Prizes include a wedding dress up to the value of £250 from Sue Charles Bridal Design of Bolton, a weekend in the Isle of Man, courtesy of Jersey European Airways, a weekend in the honeymoon suite in the Duncan Halch Hotel, and consolation prizes for all the finalists. Write today to Bride of the Year, Red Rose Radio, P.O. Box 301, St. Paul's Square, Preston. We must have your letters by the 26th of August. romantic. It's exactly 1.30. The telephone number, if you wish to join us, is Preston 56000. Hello, Charles. Hello, Alan. I think you're out of order comparing drunken drivers with pigs. I mean, pigs are quite nice animals, really. <laughs> Fair enough, Charles. <laughs> ta <-ra> now. ta <laughs> I'll do, Alan. Hello, Alan. Hello, do you, uh, Mr. Busy? Evening. Well, uh, I wonder if you can give me some information. Now, I, I bought a, a, well, I bought a car, it's a second-hand car, and it's a 1977 model, a Mini Clubman. Now, when I bought it, uh, the, well, the guys who I bought it from said they had a logbook. Now, when we come to check, we found out there was no logbook with the vehicle. Uh, do you think it would be advisable for me to apply for a logbook for that to a particular uh, car. Of course it would. You want a registration document, do you not? Yep. Well, tell the garage you want one. Uh, well, uh, I've just had the car, just no more, well, just just over a week now. And it's a good local runner, and I'm very pleased with it. Good. Well, I suggest you write to the DVLC and ask them where was the registration document, OK? Yep. Good. How do Stephen? No, Stephen is gone. How do Kathleen? Hello, Kathleen. Kathleen? Yes. Hello, is it Alan? Yes. yes. Um, I'd like to ask your advice about something. Okay, but you have to speak a little louder, Kathleen. We can only just hear you. No, it's not Kathleen, it's Kathleen. That's what I said, isn't it? No, I said Kathleen. And you are? Kathleen. Tath. Spell it for me, love. T-A-S-L-I-N. Ooh, I've not heard that before. My apologies, Tathleen. It's an Asian name. Right, <laughs> my apologies. What can we do for okay. you? okay. Well, you see, I've got a bit of a problem. I've fallen in love with a, an Englishman. And my religion won't allow us to get married or see each other. What do you think I should do? Ultimately, I cannot tell you what to do, and I would not even attempt to. You have to eventually assess what are the most valuable things in your life. A religion that forbids you to share your life with the person who you love, in my view, has to be called into question. We cannot control who we love, we cannot control who we want in our lives. And any religion that says you can't marry him or her or that person over there simply because they're not the same religion as you is a suspect religion in my view. However, it is the religion of your, should we say, heritage, probably ancestors. You have to decide what is the most important, your religion or your desire to marry that person. I can't advise you. It would be criminal of me to even attempt. Yeah, but the problem is, you see, even if I did want to uh, marry one of my own culture, yes. if it was against my family's wishes, they would still, you know, forbid it in the same way that they would forbid me to marry an Englishman. Indeed. So I appreciate... I'm sorry. Come. The thing come. is, if I somehow come to the conclusion that they are wrong and I'm right, and I did try to leave home, I know for a fact that, first of all, they would try to stop me and take very, what shall we say, you know, Extreme. try to make sure that I wouldn't go ahead with what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Is there any sort, can they stop me from doing anything? As it is a free country, I do know that. 
Well, it is meant to be. Okay. It rather depends to a certain extent. In this country, it only depends on your age. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm 23. You're 23? Yeah. Then, legally, they cannot prohibit you from marrying anyone that you may legally marry. Obviously, the religion can prevent you marrying within that religion. I don't know what religion you are, but... Muslim. OK, but the Muslim religion can say, look, these are our rules. If you don't want to obey them, then you don't, you don't share our religion anymore. They have that right. It is their, it's their game, if you like. It's their ball. Your family can make your life awkward. They can sever you from their family. They can, you know, say, I don't have a daughter and all those histrionics. There is no legal way. People have been known to be, inverted commas, virtually held prisoner in their own homes by their relatives in such circumstances. That's where I'm asking, uh, it's not right. possible, Legally, no. And court injunctions and the like could be obtained to actually deal with that. They could, in fact, be prosecuted criminally for holding a person against their wishes. But whether you want to go to that degree is a different matter. <laughs> it's a major decision, Taflin, and an extremely hard. hard decision, yes, because either way, there's not a lot of turning back, is there? No, there isn't. And irrevocable steps have to be taken very, very carefully. You have to think... Oh, it's not for me to counsel you, really. But you ought to think about 10 years' time, 15 years' time, 20 years' time. How are you going to feel then? And what happens? Because it is a reality. Yeah. What happens if in five years' time you don't like one another anymore? That's it, you see. That's You've got nowhere to go to. That's it. If I know the family turn uh, the back on me, so to speak... Then you are alone. Then I'm left alone, you know. So um, it's a major decision. I am not saying never will say that mixed, inverted commas, marriages cannot work, mm -hmm. but it can be made harder. Yeah. If your English boyfriend, uh, the man yeah. you love anyway, yeah. I, I don't know, is he a white Englishman? Yes, he is. And are you a, <laughs> I'll use this term, a brown Asian, as it were? Well, to look at me, you wouldn't say that. You wouldn't think so. OK, but your, your antecedents are Asian in the yeah, terms of, right. Well, the inevitable consequence is that your children may well be, well, obviously, will be a mixture of both. There's that horrendous term that is used by people, you'll end up with half-caste children. Now, I am not saying there's anything wrong with that, but that is a cross that they might have to bear. They will have no contact with at least one set of grandparents, probably. So there are all sorts of problems that you need to be aware of before you decide. I'm not saying either way. I'm simply saying that there are horrendous problems. I'm sure you've thought of them already. Think about them further yeah. before you decide. That, I just wish that, you know, religions could sort of expand a bit more and allow, especially in the Asian minority, there is very few. There's a lot of Asian fellows getting married to white girls. Mm. Indeed it does. And equality is, is something that should come into the Asian minority, I think, for the girls also. I mean, what right is a boy to freedom and a girl hasn't? It's, it, to me, it doesn't seem fair at all, but I'm there again, life isn't fair, is it? <laughs> Clearly not. The Muslim teaching tells you that from day one, doesn't it? Uh, yes, it does. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really follow it all that much. OK. All I can say is... It is a major step to get married full stop. Yes. It's an even more traumatic step in circumstances such as yours because although probably the door of your happiness for the rest of your life opens, you have to close an awful lot of other doors first or simultaneously. And you, you lose somewhere to run to, probably. So it's a major decision.
think about it carefully. And then, at the end of the day, I've got to say what I say to me every day. Decide what you think is right, and then damn well do it. Just do it. Just say, well, this is it. Grab hold of it and do it. And if that means in ten years' time you're on the scrap heap crying your bloody eyes out because your parents have not your back, your boyfriend or your husband's not your back, well, all right, grab the risk and run. Because you get nowhere unless you try. I'm not advocating you do it now. I'm advocating that you sit down, find a decision and say, right, this is it, this is the decision, this is what I'm doing, and the devil take the hindmost. I couldn't agree with you more. All right, love. Okay, thanks. I wish you a very special good luck. Thanks Good night. Bye-bye. Sure. Please listen to my ditty. It may not be very witty, nor even slightly funny, but it will help save you money. For me, from cradle to grave, I aim to shop and save. I buy out, I need, for next and out indeed. There's meat and veg and cheese and bix and booze and clothes and cards and sweets and pigs and pet food and household things. So shop and save a load down Blackpool's Waterloo Road, in the market they call new, and over at Road, the M2. Thank you. Poetry in prices, from the new market and M2 market. It's the place to come, where shopping can be fun. Country Music Acts, have you entered the Red Rose Radio Frontierland Talent Competition yet? Remember, the first prize is a holiday for two in Nashville, USA, courtesy of Transamerica Holidays and National Travel World, plus a two-day recording session at Avenue Parade Recording Studios in Accrington for broadcast on My Country Choice program, and the opportunity for regular work at Frontierland, Morecambe's Wild West Theme Park. Heats are on Sunday afternoons in August at Frontierland, and each heat winner will walk away with £50 and go through to the final. Just send details of your act with your name and address to me, Mike Tunstall, Red Rose Radio, P.O. Box 301, St. Paul Square in Preston. Do it now. We need your entry before the 24th of July, and you could be on your way to Nashville. Today in the studio, we have a representative from Macmillan Cars. Hey, it's grand to work on the Sassenachs at Macmillan's than who? Uh, quite. And you'll never find a better motor car than an Audi. Audi motor cars? And Volkswagen noch die macht die again. And you're saying that Macmillan's are the best people in the area for Audi and Volkswagen? You need to listen, lassie. Get yourself down there, they're grand cars. Well, there you have the voice of the expert. Macmillan's Blackburn Road Bolton, telephone 31464. They speak your sort of language. Hey, well, I'm forced to say that if Tasmin's, sorry, Tatlin's parents are listening, if her family is listening, then let me tell you, if your love of your God is greater than your love of your children, there's something wrong with your God. Now do Stuart. Hello, Alan. Yes. Uh, could I just have a word about a couple of things? Um, well, pick the most important and do that, because there's not a lot of time. Um, well, you had a lady on earlier about uh, the uh, the local estate, Looney, uh, shining the torch through the window. Um, I think you might find that that... It, it, you mentioned that, that it, it, it wasn't uh, an offence I to don't shine. think... If I did, I was wrong. Yeah. Because it can be an offence. Yeah, that's what I thought. I thought mm -hmm. it, 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 it will be covered under... Um, Likely to cause breach right. on all yeah. sorts of other yeah. things. The trouble is that getting a conviction on it... Yeah, is it's very difficult, difficult isn't and it? And that's, that's really what I'm talking about. Yeah. I think she wants to move her telephone, actually, into another room. Mm, it might be a good idea. Um, can I just have one more quick word? Go on. Uh, we do get chaps on every now and again uh, trying to give up the demon drink. Um, and over the years, I've had various periods on and off drink, um, more on it than off it. Um, I've recently stopped drinking, and I'm now, and I'm now on uh, orange juice with uh, plenty of ice in it. And I found that the way to give up was uh, me and my mate, we had a small bet of £10 uh, who would, could stop drinking the longest. And we've now gone for three months without any alcohol whatsoever. Good Lord. I'll and, tell you what, uh, Stuart, I have met some misers in my time. It's great. <laughs> yeah. it's, I'm loving every minute of it. Good actually. on you. <laughs> I okay, hope, I hope so you're banking the money, you say. That's what to do, is to have a bet with one of your mates. <laughs> right then. Okay. <laughs> You'll end up a fortnight later a gambling addict. Right, <laughs> right, Alan. Thanks a lot. Alan. How do Oswald? Oh, Alan, I'd yes. like to talk about this shoplifting business, if I can. Give us your joke and get off. There's no joke. I see. 
Right. Well, I think... Goodbye. Quite. <laughs> Spot a mile away, can't we? How do, Florence? Hello, Alan. Yes? Um, I, I want to talk about uh, gardens. Are, are you allowed to have your garden uh, as untidy as you want? Generally, yes. But it depends on whether you're a tenant or not. If you own the house and there are no strictures written down into the deeds, then yes. But if it's a council house or a private landlord's house, it may well be that your tenancy agreement requires you to look after the garden. Only a lady I know, you know, she had this note pushed through uh, from the l like lady next door mm. and um, telling her to do a garden which uh, she doesn't actually feel up to it, you know. Mm. And um, she says she can't afford, like, to get it done. And um, I said, well, I'm sure, you, like, you know... Uh, well, the simple answer to the lady next door is if you want my garden doing in that much, get in here with a shovel. Otherwise, keep your pig in neb out. Um, That's it in a, in a jiffy, love. Yeah, well... <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I told her, like, to push the, the letter by, you know, with, with man, man your own business on it, like, and... Absolutely she, right. Uh, and, and she said, like, well, she had been good to her in the past. Oh, well. And, and, and like, um, you know, like, she, she, she didn't know what to do, actually. Well, I don't know. If, if she doesn't want to do that, then neither do I. But the answer to the question is no, they can't make you put your garden in order. Certainly your neighbour can't. Obviously, as I say, if there are things in the deed saying that you've got to keep your garden respectable, because they do that sometimes on these estates, then you're stuck with it because it's in the deeds, but I don't think anyone's going to evict you for not doing. If it's a council house, then they might get a cob on, because it's their garden, not yours, you're only renting it. If it's a private landlord, he might get a cob on, if it's in the agreement that you will maintain the garden reasonably. Oh, well, I'll tell her, because I said, that, well, uh, I'll ask Callum, but I'll wait for you, you well, know. You, you tell the neighbour to get a shovel and get it done if they want it done that much. All right, love. <laughs> Thank Cheers. you. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. How do, Andy? Hello, Andy. Andy. How do, Alan? I'd uh, like to speak about uh, fun fairs. Uh, of late, it's been particularly highlighted that um, people, innocent people, are being injured riding on roller coasters at uh, well-known fun fair grounds. Well, no, let, it, let us not stalk talk in plural terms and all that. Someone has been injured on the Grand National Ride on Blackpool Pleasure Beach. The Grand National Ride has been examined by safety officers and by experts in that particular field and has been shown to be perfectly safe. Yes, but I'm not also talking, I'm talking about that because that has highlighted it and brought that to my attention. There's been other such incidences over the last year, uh, couple of years. Oh, I see. When you said recently, I thought you meant recently. It was silly of me to suspect it, really. Anyway, I think that um, since innocent people are at risk and are being injured, and in some cases killed, I think that some action should be taken, either they close that particular ride down wholesale, or what would be better would be, in fact, to shut the whole from parks off altogether and not have any more of them. Because they really but, are causing, you know... Well, just a minute. How many people are using these rights? Yes, you see, are we, go are we going to close the roads because people die on the roads? Are we going to stop people swimming in the sea because people drowned? Two young lads died in the sea recently. Well, we don't know that one has yet, but we found one body. Oh, but we presume expect that... when they go out... No, I'm day. sorry people expect. You cannot ride on a ride that makes you feel unsafe, that makes you frightened, and not expect it to be frightening. They say that they're absolutely all fairly safe. Well, we're not... Though. They say what? They say that they, they are safe when you get on them, or there's no problem in the Well, we don't yet going. know what happened in this incident. If the guy decided to think I'll jump off, or he didn't take all the proper safety precautions, you see people on these rides not having the safety belts fastened and all that, it's their own pigging fault. Well, the attendants are slap happy. At least. What do you mean, the attendants are slap happy? They're not slap happy, there'd be bodies all over the bloody place, wouldn't they, you gobhead? Glendon Motors, Peugeot, Talbot. Glendon Motors, Peugeot's number one dealer in Lancashire, has two magnificent summer deals for you. First, 0% finance on the Terrific Peugeot 205 Junior 3 on 5 door and 0% finance on a fabulous petrol 309 range excluding GTI, both with outstanding part exchange prices. Come and see these cars and many more super deals at Glandon Motors, Blackpool Road, Preston. Phone 735-811 for written details. Glandon Motors, Peugeot, Talbot. Hello there. 
I'm just having my HGV driving lesson with North Manchester HGV. They do hourly lessons and intensive courses to put you on the right road. If you're an HGV or PSV novice, for just £30, you can have a full two-hour assessment, including licence and medical fee. Now, if you pass with them, they'll guarantee you a job interview. So, what are you waiting for? Ring North Manchester HGV Training Centre on Bolton 23235. That's Bolton 23235. I'll do, Nigel. Hello, I'd like to talk about taxes, please. Do you mean the ones we're riding or the ones that are killing us? No, no, taxes. You know, you pay taxes. Yes, go on. Uh, do you know what doesn't pay taxes? I'm sure you're going to tell me. Yeah, a penis. Because 90% 90, 90 of the time it's not working, 10% of the time it's in the hole, and beside it has two, two dependents and they're both nuts. <laughs> I've got another one for you, Alan. I don't think I want it. That didn't even make me laugh. How do Billy? Hello, hello. Yes? Uh, I've got a little bit of a problem. Uh, a couple of months ago, I asked for a, a, a council grant, you know, for a bathroom. And uh, he came, the bloke came from the local council, and he said, well, he had a look through and this and other. He said, well, I'm going to have to bring my boss in. So his boss came in, and uh, he got down to nitty gritty, so I'm sorry. He said, it's that... It's that pull with the pitch, you know, mining industry. It's that pull. He said, uh, I'd seen a pro CPO on it. So I said, uh, well, what's going to happen now? He said, well, we'll have to bring your value in, and you'll have to bring your value in. But all I'm asking you, Alan, is, is there a minimum as to what they can give you for your house? Compulsory purchase order? Pardon? Do you mean in a compulsory purchase order? No. No, th what were they doing? They're condemning it. They're going to condemn it? Yeah. I don't know is the answer. You will be best advised to go to your citizens of Vice Bureau and find out from them. Yeah, so I, I thought you might have known a minimum, Alan. Well, I don't, so go to your nearest citizens of Vice Bureau and they will advise you. Yeah, well, I've got my solicitor on to be like you. Well, know. your solicitor should be able to answer that question yeah. for you, so ask him. Or her. Okay, Alan. Okay, sorry I don't know, but I don't know everything, even me. How do Tom? Hello. Yes. Alan? I'd like to talk about alcoholism. Go on. You know, I haven't been uh, an alcoholic for uh, the last 12 years. Uh, you know, uh, and on the program of recovery. Uh, I'd like to say to these people that say, oh, well, uh, we'll go on orange juice or whatever. The only answer to uh, alcoholism is you've got to find out it's a deep-rooted illness and it accelerates from uh, too much alcohol to begin with. And we all go on to, uh, you know, benders or whatever. And we all say to ourselves, oh, well, we will pack it up at some stage, and we all make false promises. You see, in AA that I went to, it's a program of denial. Uh, I'm sure that the loved ones who uh, are left behind are so used to listening to, uh, oh yes, I won't do it again. I won't go out. I won't. Hang on a minute, Tom. I understand what you're saying, but we're not talking, or we were not talking in that particular conversation to which you refer about alcoholics, just people that didn't want to have a drink anymore. Yes. <clears throat> well, the only way to not have a... Well, the only way I found to not have a drink anymore is, is completely stop altogether. Fine, but that's because you were an alcoholic. Yeah. I claim to be a non-alcohol user, but in fact that isn't the truth because quite often, three, four times a year, I will have a glass, maybe two glasses, of a decent wine, just because I feel like. Now, I, I, when I have a glass of wine, or maybe two glasses with a meal, expensive meal in a hotel somewhere, I don't suddenly think, oh my word, I'll have to have another one of these tomorrow. I don't have any problem with it at all. So what I'm saying to you is, yes, what you're telling me about alcoholics, and some people reject the disease theory, but alcoholics who are all inadequates, whether they're diseased or not is irrelevant, fine, they have a problem. 
but not everybody that drinks alcohol and would like to reduce their intake or indeed give up is an alcoholic. Yes, but by picking up the first drink in the first place, you know, a lot of people say to me, oh, it was that last one, that's why I feel so rough, that's why I feel so bad. It isn't really. Once you take up the first one, you're on the, the way, on the merry-go-round. That is crap, Doug. That may well be right for alcoholics. But I take up the first one. I've had my first drink. One would expect me to have done so at very nearly 39 years of age. I still have an occasional drink. But that doesn't put me on a treadmill when I end up selling me clothes for, for meths. I'm not an alcoholic. I know lots of people who have a drink. God bless him, we've got the yard dog next door. He can pour it down like there's no tomorrow. You'd think he didn't have a tongue sometimes. But he's not an alcoholic. He could give up if he wanted. The way he's going on, he might have to. Yes, so, can, can you understand getting on the merry-go-round? Well, no, I can't understand getting on the merry-go-round. As far as I'm concerned, alcoholics are inadequate. They need a crutch to lean on. So they either have the crutch of alcohol or the crutch of their fellow alcoholics at Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not condemning them for that. But I can't be doing with all this patronising crap that people come on saying there's only one way to do without drink and that is to never take it and all that crap. What a load of garbage. That's right if you happen to be an alcoholic. The majority of the population happen not to be. And they can stop drinking because they don't want to anymore. No, I beg your pardon. You can beg all you like. No, there's a hell of a lot. If you think about it, there's a hell of a lot of people in this country and we're going into now probably thousands of millions with a drink. Thousands of millions? Yeah, with a drink. Boulder dash. Boulder dash. Thousands of millions. We haven't got that many in the country. Perhaps you've been drinking too much. Good night. How do you, Doug? Hello, Doug. Hello. What do you want? I'd like to talk about baseball. Well? American baseball. What is preventing you, apart from the fact that your radio is clattering away in oh, the background? I no, haven't heard you. Turn the radio off now. We've gone out, yeah. I don't want it to we go out. I want it off. Baseball. Shut up! Sorry. Right. Now you may proceed. OK. We play American, American baseball, and the support we get is terrible. Well, you must be crap, then. Well, it's for this Merseyside... You team, must be you crap, know. then. Well... Well, 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 look, what do you want me to do? Do you want a law passed? People have got to watch it, because the, the only way you're going to get people to watch it, Americans watch it, but they're as thick as pig muck. <laughs> English people don't watch it because it's so god-awful boring. Well, that sounds fair enough. But there's a team that comes from Preston as well. Well, well it doesn't make it any less boring, because they come from Preston. I thought you'd be excited about that. I'm not in the least bit excited. I don't care what people do with their spare time, as long as you don't expect me to go and watch them. Well, you may think it's fair or not fair. I don't really care. Anyone that stands there hitting a ball with a stick has got to be a bit mental. How do, Keith? Hello, Alan. What I'd do like you want? To, I'd like to talk about drugs, if I, if I can. You may have time. Let us hear what you've got to say. Well, it's just simply like, I'm sure you've heard it before, that I'd like a uh, cannabis legalised. Why? Because I think it's so uh, stupid that the uh, the government should not pay, uh, should allow tax not to be paid and that. Well, could, uh, well, don't why, don't we why don't we take 10% of our bank robbers? Because that's stupid. Look at all the money we're wasting yeah, there. Fella, did, fella, took ten, fella took at least 12 million quid this morning, uh, or yesterday, out of yeah, safety deposit know. boxes. Yeah. We've missed out there if we were on 25% tax. Yeah, that's that 3 million. Pure, pretty good. Yeah, that was pure now I'm convinced you're a junkie. <laughs> Hey!
isn't it lovely? Back tonight at ten. The dready Derek is with you till six. Have yourselves a very good morning, good day, good evening. I'll be back at ten tonight. Ta-ra. The two o'clock news. This is Therese Birch. The banned memoirs of former MI5 agent Peter Wright could be published in Britain within the next few weeks. A lawyer for the publishers of Spycatcher is predicting that the book will be published in August, now that it's gone on sale in America and copies are already arriving here. Spy writer and recently elected Tory MP Rupert Allison, who uses the pen name Nigel West, is revealing that four more spy books are being prepared for publication here. He says he's been asked to look at various manuscripts based on the lives of Secret Service agents. These are not sort of stunning revelations. These are people who've had fascinating careers. They may have died, they may have left their literary executors with their diaries, and this kind of material um, obviously has a market. And at the moment there are certainly at least four cases that I'm aware of of people who have sought permission to publish. The government is being accused of sprinkling the countryside with radioactive material to make military training more authentic. The Ministry of Defence is admitting that radioactive substances are used in exercises to prepare for accidents involving nuclear weapons, but say there's no risk to the public. Linda Duffin reports. Radioactive dust was scattered over a half-mile area in one training exercise in Staffordshire, says the independent newspaper. Hundreds of sackfuls of soil were later removed, but no effort was made to clean up outside the limits, leaving patches of radioactivity. In another case, it says RAF firemen were exposed to heavy radiation with no medical follow-up checks. The Ministry of Defence admits radioactive material is used in exercises. A spokesman says it's prudent to use the real thing when training people to deal with emergencies, but denied procedures were sloppy. Stringent medical and safety safety precautions are taken, he says. Two people have been killed and another 25 are feared dead after a torrent of water and mud swept through a campsite in the French Alps. The site was crowded with tourists when the River Bourne, near the border with Switzerland, burst its banks following a violent summer storm. 230 rescuers are searching for survivors. A young woman is being held hostage by an armed man on a train in the southern Belgian city of Charleroi. Police have taken up positions outside the carriage, which has been uncoupled from the rest of the train, which had made a stop in the city en route from Paris to Stockholm. Tough new laws to deal with people who mistreat animals are being introduced by the government today. People found guilty of cruelty to pets could face a six-month jail sentence and a fine of up to £2,000. The crackdown has been prompted by the growth of dog baiting, and Tory MP Harry Greenaway, who's behind the legislation, says the punishment has to fit the crime. Motors of dog fights... And, you know, they use the pit bull terriers, which will fight to the death. You know, take a hold with a bite and not let go until death. And it's a very, very wicked thing to exploit that. Uh, now, with penalties of £2,000 per offence, I mean, somebody convicted of five or ten offences would pay £20,000 in fine. Independent Radio News. <laughs> 